Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Hey, yeah. How you doing? Good morning. Good day. Good evening. Whatever works for you. So this is the very first of our summer specials for the Plant Based Podcast. The first episode is from me and it's a mini Plant Geeks podcast. Next week, Ellen's here with her mini wellbeing podcast and each alternate week we'll be leapfrogging each other with those different subjects. So you won't hear the other person on these podcasts because we've recorded them solo And I found that when I record solo, I'm a lot more serious, which is very strange. And I listened back to the recording yesterday and I was like, who is this person? So I hope you enjoy that. But still, the same amount of information is there. We talked to some great people in this Sweet Pea episode that's coming up. I talked to a guy named Phil who is just, oh my gosh, he is a Sweet Pea aficionado. He really is. You'll get all sorts of tips on how to grow the very best Sweet Peas. We also talk about them from the very beginning. So we talk about how they came to Europe and when. Do all sweet peas smell the same? Do they have different kind of layers of fragrance? How are they bred? Tell us the difference between a flake and a ripple. What colours are they breeding next? And of course, how to grow them. Because sweet peas, i got to tell you, are my nemesis. I really, I can't grow them. I'm really rubbish at growing them. And I see people like Ellen growing them and she's just, <laughs> no. Not going to be cheeky to Ellen, but, you know, people grow them so easily on their allotments and kind of, I just always fail. And even this year, I put them into a container, nice deep container, kept up the watering, I mulched them, but maybe I didn't enough. Maybe I needed to feed them more, but this is where, well, perhaps I should have listened to Phil's advice if I'd had it when I planted up. So I hope you really, really enjoy this mini Plant Geeks podcast. Please leave us a five-star review. That's the only one that we accept these days. So please just uh, put that into Apple Podcasts or drop us a line on social media. Let me know what your sweet pea tips are. Maybe there's some kind of old wives tales where you put, I don't know, crushed biscuit around the plants or something like that. So let me know what you've got in mind. So this week, Plant Geek's mini podcast is all about sweet peas with Phil from uh, Seed Links down in Essex. Next time, after Ellen's well-being mini episode next week, I'll be talking to you about petunias. And that will be coming from Cambridge with the Curly family who've bred some of the most amazing petunias. And also in the series, I'll be talking about antirhinums and one final plant. I might do that as a viewer vote, actually. So, yeah, so good luck with your sweet peas, guys. If you've got them already in bloom, then A, I'm jealous, and B... You need to pick them and enjoy them indoors because one thing I know about sweet peas, when you keep picking them, you get even more blooms on them. And actually, when I was back at TNM, we did a test once and we managed to get 10 weeks of blooms on those plants. But I wasn't the one growing them, so they had their best chance of success. So enjoy the episode. Sweet peas are my nemesis. Make sure they're not yours next season. Bye. So, sweet peas, they're that quintessential English flower. You probably remember your grandparents growing them. You recognize the fragrance. You can probably imagine it right now. But what are the tips to growing the best sweet peas? And have sweet peas been developed over the years? So I'm here today in Essex with Phil Johnson, who's a sweet pea enthusiast and the owner of English Sweet Peas. And he's pretty much running a living library here of sweet peas. The fragrance is amazing. The colors are not your traditional pastel 
colors. There's also richer colors. There's color shifting. There's flakes, ripples. There's all sorts here. So, Phil, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yes. Tell us all about you, where your love of sweet peas first began, and then a little bit about your career and how you're here today and what you're up to with sweet peas. So, start us off. What's your first memories of Thanks. growing well, sweet peas? First memories of growing sweet peas were actually quite close to here, just on the other side of Colchester. Uh-huh. And uh, that was at my uncle and aunt's uh, small holding. And uh, my aunt had grown some sweet peas. And uh, I just fell in love with them at that stage. And uh, I was eight then, oh. so a few years ago. And uh, she sent me some seeds the next year, uh -huh. grew some at home. Uh -huh. And uh, the rest is history, so to speak. Uh -huh. Do you remember the variety or mixed? Uh, they would have been some, some very old varieties. So uh -huh. we'd have had some, probably some Leming Lemington, some Mrs. CK, some Carlotta, things that you, you may still find a few today, but uh, uh -huh. even And you remember the colors, the fragrance? Yeah, the, the, particularly the fragrance, yeah. but yeah, the, the, the bright colors as well. It was all just attractive, even at such a tender wow. age. I was always fascinated with sweet peas because I liked things that climbed that kind yep. of gave that yep. quick growth because it just seemed more satisfying yeah, in some sort of way. I think, you know, for, for a child when you're young, you want to see sort of quick results and, uh, yeah, sweet peas mm -hmm. would certainly do that. Okay, and give us a few little snapshots of your career that have kind of brought you on that sweet pea journey and brought you into this living library of sweet peas here today. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I started uh, over 40 years ago growing them, as, uh, as I've sort of said. And uh, from quite soon after starting to grow them, I joined the, the National Sweet Pea Society, a mm -hmm. uh, band of enthusiasts. And uh, from then I'd started showing at, uh, at the tender age of 16, went off to their national shows and, and really got the bug at that, at that time. For many years that was uh, very much about uh, growing for the shows, uh, a mm -hmm. fantastic hobby, I'd highly recommend it. Um, at a more recent times, uh, I've moved on to be more involved with the, with the Sweet Pea Society um, and uh, trials at Wisley and RHS uh, and all sorts of things from, from that side. Mm -hmm. Breeding uh, sweet peas has been a more recent thing, so probably just the last 10 years ago or so, uh, mm -hmm. and that's another fascinating mm -hmm. hobby uh, linked to sweet peas. It's quite easy, is it? Something people could do at home. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, people think that it's it's all quite uh, in, in intensive and, and technical, but it's uh -huh. once you've crossed the the pollen from one type onto the stigma of another, mm -hmm. save those seeds. Then it's uh, it's all about selecting the ones you like year after year, okay. keeping those. Separate. Maybe we'll touch on that a bit more yeah, in the sure. kind of growing section at the end. So yeah, and then kind of you've obviously recently bought the company Seedlinks, which yep. is the wholesale kind of big sweet pea provider in the UK, isn't that's, it? That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah we're certainly the, the biggest wholesale grower mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the UK these mm -hmm. days. Okay, and obviously you're selling to the public through English Sweet Peas. Yes. There's a website there, but also yep. through Johnson's as well. That's right, I, yeah. I started Johnson's um, about 14, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's still very, you know, very small thing, very specialist, but uh, that sort of led me on to showing an interest in, in acquiring seed links and mm -hmm. English sweet peas as, okay. as time came on. And there's that quintessential Essex countryside <laughs> airplane noise as well. Perfect. Even during lockdown. Yeah? <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so let's kind of talk about sweet peas a lot more because I've got so many questions, so many kind of wonderingments. So, sweet peas, first of all, Kind of in the wild, they're a scrambling plant, aren't they? And Indeed. where were the first sweet peas kind of found and grown? Okay, so as, as far as we know, mm. as far as records seem to indicate, uh, sweet peas originate from Sicily, mm -hmm. um, and certainly that Mediterranean era, um, area. Um, I'm not exactly sure when they, when they were first sort of recognised as such, but uh, they were sent over to the UK in 1699, so we've already had a okay. tercentenary. Mm -hmm. um, and they were sent over by a, a monk named Franciscus Cupani, um, um, from near Palermo, I believe, in Sicily. Uh, sent them over to a chap called uh, Robert Uverdale, who was a schoolmaster at Enfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, they've been grown and, and uh, you know, nurtured ever since. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm right in saying that from those very early days, first few years, uh, the, the, there is a specimen that I think held in the British Library of some of those very first uh, sweet peas. So oh, wow. uh, a long history. Uh -huh. And would sweet peas still grow in the wild in Sicily then, or how does yeah, that work? Yeah, e even quite recently, uh, seeds have been collected from the wild oh, really? in Sicily. So they're, they're that would be a dream to there. see, wouldn't it? It would be wow. great, wouldn't it? Oh my gosh. 
And is that the only place in the world that sweet peas are originating from? The, or the ones that have been grown into the modern day garden varieties, I guess? Certainly as regards yeah. Latheris odoratus, yeah. the, the true Because I know there's a lot of other kind of know. perennial types and other sorts yeah, as well. Yeah, lots of other species, yeah. yeah. Okay, so kind of back to the kind of home gardener sweet pea. How did it go from that small, quite scrambling plant that, fair enough, had nice colours, but not really big blooms? How did that go to what we have today? Well, in those first sort of couple of hundred years and until sort of towards the end of the 19th century, there were a few sort of natural mutations, if you like. So mm -hmm. the first one that we know of was Painted Lady, that I'm sure a lot mm -hmm. of people have heard of, where we've then got that pink and white uh, colour. So that mutated from the original, from the original Machicana. Yes. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a lot done really until towards, as I say, the, the end of the 19th century when uh -huh. a few breeders started to get involved and particularly uh, Henry Eckford, who mm -hmm. you may have, uh, may have heard of, and he really uh, made, uh, put a lot of work into developing the, the range and also the size of those sweet peas um, at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and at that stage, did he have to make it like, he had to give, make bigger blooms, obviously more show, but also a more upright plant, because before then it was just quite scrambly, wasn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. Um, he, he'd managed to, um, encourage more vigour into those mm. plants which mm -hmm. would have produced the larger stems and the, and the taller growing plants mm -hmm. at, at that stage. Okay, and those Eckford varieties, what, are they the Grandifloras or what would they be? Known at that as? time they were called Grandifloras because right. the blooms were that much bigger than what uh -huh. was already around like the Cupani okay. and the Painted Lady. But these days of course we've moved on to other strains with much bigger blooms than what were originally called mm -hmm. Grandifloras. So what the Eckfords are now seen as heirloom varieties? Or? Yeah, we, we t tend to call them either heirloom or old-fashioned uh -huh. uh, types. Okay. And then kind of things developed a little bit more quite a few years later and there's Princess Diana somehow involved with the... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's the a development link, of there's a peas. link to the Spencer yeah. family. Maybe a little bit tentative, but yeah, yeah well, it's, it's quite a <laughs> <laughs> it's quite distant, really. Yeah. Um, so the story is that in uh, 1900, which mm -hmm. uh, when Eckford was sort of at the peak of his um, hybridising and releasing of new varieties. Um, in three places, I believe, in, in the UK, but particularly well known is at Althorpe Park, where mm -hmm. the Spencer family live, and hence the Lady Diana, Princess Diana uh, mm -hmm. connection. Um, the the, the uh, head gardener there, uh, Silas Cole, found a uh, mutation in a row of prima donna, one mm -hmm. of Eckford's varieties, and the difference there was that the petals were ruffled, were frilled, whereas previously they'd been very, very plain, very very flat. Okay. Even he, though they were big flowers, they weren't particularly waved that's or it. fancy. Okay. And he recognised that as a, as a distinct uh, improvement and mm -hmm. then saved the seed, um, brought it along to um, <coughs> a, a sweet pea show. Uh, I believe that was 1900 bicentenary celebrations we were having mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, an awful lot of work has been done, particularly with the Spencers over those last 120 years. Mm -hmm. And they're still popular today? Very much yeah. so, yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. So those are the ones that we see these days with the long stems and the big frilly flowers. Those mm -hmm. are the Spencer type that 120 years ago. Okay. And there's another group that I'm fascinated with, which is the stripes and the Picatees. And, and earlier you told me there's a really good way of recognising the difference between, what is it, a flake and a ripple? Yeah. And it's really quite obvious when you explain it, isn't it? You, you need to see the two different types together because uh -huh. superficially they see the same. But think of the chocolate bars, always a favourite, I think. Um, and flakes, if you remember a flake, the, the chocolate sort of, uh, the, the layers in it run right out to the end of the bar. Mm -hmm. So we call sweet, sweet peas flakes. I, ah. I don't think that was the original connection. I okay. Think it's <laughs> and then if you think of a ripple bar, so it's like a flake on the inside, but it has a coating of chocolate around the outside. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call a, a ripple sweet pea. Um, mm -hmm. So it has those flaked markings, but it also has an edge to the petals as well. Okay. So, and there's also there a kind of marble type that you've shown me as well, where yep. it's got the veining. What, what are they classified as veined? Or? Well, we, we call those marbled. Ah, oh, marbled, um, okay. It's because those oh. veins have a, a stronger colour than the rest of the petal, and uh -huh. it stands out like, like marble. Okay, and that almost changes as the bloom's age as well, doesn't it? Yes, it yeah. does, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Because there is another very interesting type of sweet pea, which is called a colour-shifting variety, which is quite a new introduction. Yep. And there's a big story behind that as well, because it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, was it? It was... 
no, the quest wasn't. for another type of sweet pea, wasn't it? I think as often happens with uh, hybridising and things, you, you get these offshoots and, mm. uh, and things that you don't, uh, you know, branches you don't intend to go down. Now, uh, I think in the mid-80s, I think it was 1985, there was another species of um, sweet pea cousin mm -hmm. uh, found in Turkey, and that was Lathyrus bellinensis, okay. uh, which is a, a little scrambling uh, plant. Yeah, it's and yellow and yeah, orange, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Ah. Um, so very recently found in, in comparative terms, and ah. at that time we were sweet pea uh, nuts. Mm -hmm. Sweet pea enthusiasts were looking around f to get some sort of buttercup yellow ideally yeah. into sweet peas uh, because that's really There's always the, that holy grail in every missing. genus isn't there like give me a yellow fuchsia, give me a yellow sweet pea, give me a blue geranium you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I think in the first instance uh, Keith Hammett um, f who's out in New Zealand mm -hmm. managed to cross this Lathyrus bellinensis onto uh, Mrs. Collier I believe uh, which we've seen earlier and um, progeny of that, with the idea of coming up with this buttercup yellow uh, sweet pea, mm -hmm. produced this uh, shifting colour. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's where the, the colour changes from conventional sort of sort, sorts of shades to very uh, intense blue, whether it be deep blue or, or turquoise mm -hmm. blue. So not yellows at all? Not yellows at all. <laughs> but something interesting nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah very, very novel. Uh -huh. But um, people are still out there trying to make a yellow and... Definitely, yeah. yeah. And confidentially, I saw one about an hour ago, no, but oh, we're not going to show that. that we're not going to talk too much about that. Telling. So. But, um, a way to go, yeah. I can edit that out if you want later. I just get excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so also in the 80s, there's a company that are quite known for sweet peas as well, so Unwins. Unwins did a bit of development with sweet peas as well, because when I was a kid, that was, that was the type of sweet pea you wanted to grow. You know, your short packet of Unwins sweet peas there. You're going to grab them, you're going to get them sown. So how, what did they do for the sweet pea market? Uh, Unwins were in at, at the very early stages of, of sweet peas. So mm. they were originally um, cut flower growers. Um, and then when this Spencer variation w was found, uh, within a year or two, they discovered that it was better for them to go into seed production rather than cut flowers. Okay. And they had a, a very big uh, breeding program for, for many, many years until mm -hmm. they were uh, taken over um, and put an awful lot of, of new varieties into the market, uh -huh. some of which are still available today. And that breeding would have been just outside Cambridge, I guess? Yeah, at, at yeah. Heston, yep. yeah. yeah. Okay. Because quite a lot of sweet pea breeding is in the UK, actually, isn't it? I know you've got New Zealand with Keith Hammett, but yep. people don't realise how much is being bred in the UK. Yes, yeah. I, I would say probably these days, the majority of sweet pea breeding in the world is, is, is within the UK. Mm. Uh, there and was a time where it was commercially in, out in uh, California, but that, that sort of trade has, has, has died away now. Okay, and that is some amateurs? but also some companies too. Yep. Yeah, certainly in the UK, it's it's a mixture of both. Uh -huh. yes. And you're a sweet pea breeder yourself, aren't you? So yeah. you have a dabble. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, have a dabble, it's good fun. Oh, yeah. I don't have enough to do at weekends, so that's that's my, <laughs> my weekend hobby. Uh, so if somebody at home did want to breed a sweet pea, how, how easy would that be? It, it would be pretty straightforward. Mm. You, you, it's it's a job to describe it in words without sort of being able to show you yeah. in, in, in reality how to do it. But as I say, it's mm -hmm. it's really taking the bloom from one uh, colour that, you, that you'd that you like uh, mm -hmm. and putting it onto another. Okay, so really fun to have an experiment and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I could describe that in a lot of detail, but you, you need a, a mm -hmm. very young bloom to uh, take the pollen mm -hmm. because they shed the pollen at a very early stage before they're open. And obviously once their own pollen's been shed, then that seed's already... Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you need set. to get to it before it's, yeah. before it's ready to go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about growing sweet peas because over the years I've never found it that easy because I'm not... I'm, I'm a gardener, but I'm not that attentive in my gardening so okay. i know sweet peas do need a lot of water yep they need a lot of like well rotted organic matter um if you grow them in containers that's perhaps even more of a challenge but can you give us a few tips to get the best out of sweet peas like with how you care for them but also the type of varieties you choose to grow in the first place is okay. there a difference yeah lots of lots of questions there mm. michael thank you <laughs> um so 
growing them as such, the sort of cultural needs are, are, are pretty straightforward, I think, in that they really don't want to dry out. So keep them regularly watered. Okay. Um, and as you say, if you can get some bulky organic matter into the into the soil in particular, then mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big help. So it would be like well-rotted manure or fresh compost even? Or yeah, well, I, I suppose... Not yeah, potent enough. Yeah, I would, it's really sort of holding the moisture there. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, you can always add in the fish mm -hmm. blood and bone, the, the, the general fertiliser, but you need something to hold the moisture mm -hmm. around the roots. It's the dry Is it right that people underestimate well. how much feed Absolute, sweet Absolutely, need? yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but can you overfeed or not? Because that's is, where people would worry, isn't it? It is possible, but if you're yeah. following the instructions on the, yeah. on the packet, then you you won't go far wrong. Mm -hmm. And also, with a with a little bit of experience, you'll you'll know when they you know when they need a bit more, when they're looking a bit uh, a, bit, mm -hmm. a bit weak. Okay, so in the soil, you would use fish blood and bone. For yeah. me, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. I like to use fish blood and bone. It's reasonably all organic. I think I'm right in saying, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, fairly quick acting. Okay, yeah, so, so in terms of bringing on to flour, potash is not going to have the same well, effect. The potash, is, as you know, is, is mm. great for the flowers, but doesn't really add any nitrogen for the, for yeah. the food. And unless your plant's healthy, you're not going to get great blooms, yeah. are you? So, yeah. Absolutely. And so if you are growing in soil, make sure you improve the soil as much as possible. Make yep. sure you're mulching to keep the moisture locked in as well. Yep. Yep. But in containers, that's even more difficult sometimes, isn't it? So, Well, I always like to say use as large a container as possible mm -hmm. because it's going to take longer for it to dry out. So, and as we already said, that's so when you say large, that's what, the, um, half the issue. Diameter of? Yeah, a diameter of, uh, so where are we? What, what 50 centimetres if you can? Yeah, what you're showing me is huge. Yeah. Well, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's go uh -huh. there. So. I, I okay. would say, yeah, if you can get 50 centimetres. Uh -huh. And depth as bigger. well. General rule of thumb, if you can, deeper mm -hmm. than wide. Okay. So those sort of classic uh -huh. flower pot shape containers. Okay. If you're going to try in a, a window box or something, it's going to be a struggle, certainly mm -hmm. for the, the more okay. vigorous growing types. I think probably for a lot of people trying to grow sweet peas for the first time, they're probably going to whack them in a window box and hope for the best. But really, deep pots, yep. lots of moisture, yep. the highest quality compost you can afford. Yeah, I, I like mm. to use a combination of some John Innes, maybe mm -hmm. a number two, and some multi-purpose. I find that that combination um, works quite well for okay. me. And what feeding regime would you then use in containers? The same as open ground or...? I would uh, prob probably not because I think you need to be using that uh, liquid fertiliser once a week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'd certainly be feeding them yeah. once a week. Okay. Um, and how do we keep them moist? Do we have a source of below, water from below, add a mulch? How do we make sure containers don't dry out? Because that's quite difficult. Well, isn't I, it? I think if you've got one of these wonderful watering systems, then then that's great, and you can put some a couple of drippers into there. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. But okay. for me, I'm old school watering yeah. can. Okay. Checking it daily. But using a saucer, we can top that up as a reservoir, yep. or will they not enjoy sitting well, wet? Well, they don't really want to sit in water, yeah. particularly when they're at that young stage. As, okay. as we are in the middle of the summer and it's warm and they're growing like mad, then mm -hmm. not such an issue. But certainly okay. at the early stage, they don't want to be... So we're really talking watering regime, very important. Yeah. Set reminders yeah. on your phone. Not too tricky, yeah. but just, you know, when they're growing well and it's warm or, or windy in particular, mm -hmm. then lots of water. Okay, so early stages is really important to get those strong plants that will then... And, you know, play host to lots of beautiful blooms. That's so. it, yeah. Okay. Also in containers, mm. um, don't try and grow the, the really big expensive flowered ones, the really vigorous ones, mm -hmm. because you're not going to get the, the best blooms out of that. Mm -hmm. So pick the, 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 um, the old-fashioned ones that we've, we mentioned already, the heirloom okay. types. Um, next stage up from that, the modern grandifloras, so they're like the heirlooms but more vigorous. Mm -hmm. Or go for what we call the... the um, Intermediate size ones, so they'd normally get up to about waist height. Is Lovely. that the Solway series? Yeah, Solway series is, is yeah. an example of that. That's really nice because it almost looks it doesn't need that much support either. You yep. could probably just use a few old twigs yep. in the they're, container I'm too. sure they'd be great for containers. Yeah, and getting no more than about two or three feet, which is really manageable, but still long enough stems to cut from yep. doors as yep. well. Yep. Ticks all the boxes. Excellent. Okay, and I had a question earlier about fragrance. So is fragrance the same across all sweet peas, or does it differ like it does in roses? Like, are some a bit more spicy, some a bit more sweet? It's, I think it, I think <laughs> it varies from one variety to another. Uh. But as a general rule, if you go for the, for the heirloom types, the old-fashioned types, they have, for me, a very complex, very spicy, sort of intense scent. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I can almost find it a bit too much. Okay. Uh, like I take some home and I have to open the window because it's just too mm -hmm. much. 
the Spencer type, the ones with the long stems and the big frilly flowers, for me, they have a, a less complex scent and almost sort of citrus tones and things. Wow. So it's, 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 it's different. So I it think. is layered. Yeah, I, yeah. I, and there's lots of variations within all that general general. Have you ever thought of sending some blooms to a wine expert? <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds crazy, but when I was, um, I was at Thompson Morgan, as you know, for about 20 years, and we were doing all sorts of product development, all sorts of like marketing ploys, which is what, what counts at the end of the day. And we took the polyamphus tuberosa, Yep, you know, the tuberose yep, yep, bloom. Yep. And we sent it to a wine expert and he came back and sort of gave it a sniff and kind of told us the layers of fragrance. And he described it in a really poetic way, like it was green tea with undertones of jasmine and a hint of nutmeg. And it was, and it really made a lot of sense. I wonder yeah. if you can do that with some of your well, top it's, it's, sweet pea yeah, varieties. It's worth the thought. It, yeah. it, it's certainly an area of work there. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, so talking about different styles of sweet pea, so you've talked about the taller the ground of floras, the intermediates, but there's something even smaller that exists, isn't there? There's a hanging basket sweet pea. What do you make of those? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're great things for, uh, for hanging baskets, for, mm. for sli maybe for slightly smaller containers, but you do need to keep on top of them. Uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, as soon as you see a, a flower going over or some, a seed pod, take it off because they, if you don't do that, they're going to stop yeah. flowering quite quickly. So they okay. do need a bit of maintenance. And that's true of um, standard tall sweet peas as yes, well, isn't it? Yes, but yeah. to a, they're a bit more tolerant of, uh -huh. of deadheading. Okay. And obviously keep picking the flowers for indoors and you'll get even more blooms. And Absolutely. I remember again at Thompson Morgan, we did a technical experiment once and I think we managed to get 10 weeks of blooms from sweet peas because we just kept cutting them mm. and making sure they yep. never, ever went to seed. Yep. I mean, does that sound... Um, realistic to you, or do you think you could get more than 10 weeks out of a plant? <laughs> I think you could probably get, well, I don't, mm. not necessarily out of a plant, but mm. by successional sowing. Out of a row, yeah. Uh, and by using some different types as well. You, you, you know, yeah. we had our first blooms under glass um, late March this year, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly if we, we'd done a, a late sowing, we could well be into September. Mm -hmm. uh, I've even had them as late as November. Okay, wow. Um, so, oh. you know, you can uh -huh. have a very long season with them. Because there's an important question there. A lot of people these days are buying plants of sweet peas, yep. but also a lot of people are still sowing seeds, and a lot of beginners might be looking to grow sweet peas from seed. When are they best sown? Because there's two schools of thought, isn't there? What is ultimately the best time? Oh dear, there's a question. Um, <laughs> I would, I would normally, I'm, I'm changing as time goes on. I'm changing uh -huh. my thoughts. Sort of. Normally, I would have said, yeah, sow them in the autumn. Mm -hmm. uh, sow them in October, half a dozen mm -hmm. in a one liter pot, uh, and then pop them in a cold frame mm -hmm. uh, if you if you possibly can. Even a cold greenhouse could be too warm over the winter. Because mm -hmm. they they would be hardy but they'd still need a tiny bit of protection. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, are, they are incredibly tough things. Yeah, uh, I think I, people don't realise that, so they think autumn sowing, oh gosh, they're not going to protect them, or what have they, I got to they, do? They're so. hardy annuals. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, a few years ago, we had some harder weather where, where I was at the time, and I was growing all these in, in cold frames. We had temperatures down to minus 10, minus 12, even mm -hmm. in this part of the, the world, and we had snow cover for uh, at least a week. Yeah. Peas were still out there. They just had a, a, really? a tarpaulin over the top. That's all mm. they had. And uh, I took them out, and I'd actually lost a few where a mouse had got in there. Uh -huh. But virtually no losses so through the a cold. mouse, not the snow. <laughs> but the, the secret is in that instance, that yes, they can freeze absolutely solid, but thaw them out slowly. Okay. If they thaw out too quickly, that's when you lose How them. How do you thaw them out slowly, though? Well, if you if you've got a sharp frost forecast, yeah. and I know this is you know maybe more detail and more detail more, is good. Uh, yeah, yeah, more uh, work than a lot yeah. of people would want. But if you've got a, a hard frost forecast, you know minus three below, cover up your, your cold frame with um, an old blanket with a tarpaulin, something of like that to exclude the light. It's the light that seems to be the thing more okay. than the temperature, uh -huh. and then. A day, following day, or the day after, once temperature starts to warm up, mm -hmm. and once the compost is starting to thaw out, take that covering off, mm -hmm. and they'll be fine. Okay. So with an autumn sowing, when can we expect those to flower? I would say probably early May. Uh -huh. So if you're okay. sowing in October, plant out in March as soon as you can, mm -hmm. and then um, yeah, you probably see some blooms in mm -hmm. early May. 
but you were saying that you're not a champion for autumn sow now. You are starting to spring sow and you're well, seeing similar results? Yeah, it's, it, if you are sowing them in the autumn, you're going to get bigger plants, you're mm -hmm. going to get earlier flowering, and you're probably going to get a slightly longer flowering period. Mm -hmm. But these days I would say uh, successional sow them. So do an autumn uh -huh. sow, okay. sow some in January, sow some in April, and you've got a mm -hmm. much longer flowering season. So you get an even longer period. Okay, that's great. How about, I just want to delve a little bit into the other kind of species. And are there any species that you see merit in as a patio plant or a border plant? Such as, I remember at Thompson Morgan, we were big fans of Lapharus nervosus, which is quite a nice kind of patio plant. Could be a bit flower shy until it gets a bit developed, but are there any kind of species or more oddities that you would recommend to people out there? Yeah, uh, Nervosa's a yeah, great variety, um, mm -hmm. and by coincidence, we're working on, on bringing that back into production now. Mm -hmm. It's not completely hardy, mm -hmm. but it has those wonderful glaucous blue leaves yeah. and that really showy uh, blue flowers and, the, and some scent as well, which is unusual for our other Lathera species. So, uh -huh. yeah, cracking variety. Other things to look at, Lathera's furnace. It's yes. herbaceous <gasps> perennial. Yeah. It's well behaved, it's nice and compact, it mm -hmm. looks bushy with just the leaves on it and those wonderful flowers in uh, February, March and April, yeah. uh, cracking little uh, border plant, patio plant. Yep, really yeah, Lapras vernus is a really cracking little plant. Um, I used to like the kind of uh, more species like Azurias and obviously Bellinensis, but they are weedy, aren't they really? They're... Yeah, not, not, not so attractive. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, Lathras aureus, which is a bit uh -huh, bigger yeah. than, uh, than yeah. Vernus, has those sort of orangey, orangey yellow tones, but it seems, always seems to me to be a bit flower shy. Mm -hmm. And then of course you've got wonderful Lathras latifolius for that, oh, yes, for that large course. perennial climber. Yeah. Uh, but the number of people that expect it to have a fragrance. I, know, I, I know. even see it listed in mail order yeah. catalogues sometimes. Yeah. Fragrant evergreen sweet pea. It's like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> Great garden plant, loads yeah. of flower, but no uh, scent. Has anybody ever looked at the genetics to, but yeah, not it, possible? It's, it's been tried uh, mm. numerous times, I think, to cross the two. Um, the intensity of the genetics isn't quite my thing, I must admit, but uh, they don't seem compatible at yeah. this stage. Okay. So it is like in sweet peas, there's still a few things that are the holy grail. So Absolutely. we've got Absolutely. the yellow, That's we've got the so. obviously evergreen perennial fragrant. Um, any other colours people really want to get to that aren't happening? Well, I suppose the uh, orange and mm. uh, the, the sort of soft apricot I've peach. I've just seen a lovely orange in your yeah, crops here. They're, they're great. And they're, yeah. as, as we've seen, there's so much colour there and really intense. What and was really, that variety? That was uh, Prince of Orange. Prince of Orange. Uh, but it's quite an older one, yeah, wasn't it? It is. Well. Yeah, 1928, that one. Mm. But the issue seems to be getting to them to set uh, sufficient seed uh, to, to produce them in uh, commercial quantities. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, I'm sure, why they're not so widely available. Uh -huh. Okay. So we're going to talk about where people can buy sweet peas in a moment, but before we go there, what do you have one sweet pea you need to grow in your garden every year? What is your absolute favourite? Or is that like asking someone to choose their favourite child? It's, <laughs> it is. It's so difficult because people say, oh, what, what's your favourite? Yeah. And, and the honest answer is, I like the next one that I see because yeah. I, I love all of them. I'm the same. I hate that question when someone asks, what's your favourite plant? <laughs> But, but you must have a rehearsed answer. Yeah, right? yeah variety. I'm, I'm, all right, I'm going to expand it. I'm going to say there's five varieties. Okay. Okay. Five varieties. And these are the ones that tick the box oh, that they're these easy, are top tips. Then. Easy to grow. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, really strong fragrance. Mm -hmm. And decent length of stem that you can cut in a vase as well. So those are the ones. So mm -hmm. we start off with Maticana. Yes. Yeah, we, I'm sure we, we all know that the one. The classic. Yeah, classic. That's where it all began. Strongly. Mm. Strongly fragrant, uh, str fragrant, mm -hmm. uh, uh, good, uh, good colour, mm -hmm. really good. All but blue. Okay. Same sort of style. It's uh -huh. white. It has a blue edge to it. Okay. Really intense uh -huh. uh, scent. But a smallish bloom. Yeah, like relatively, classic relatively smallish style. blooms. Okay. But now I'd say somewhere between the heirlooms and, and the Spencers, so an intermediate uh, okay. sort of size. Uh -huh. um, Sicilian pink. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a more vigorous painted lady. Loads of blooms. It's got a, a, these have all got AGMs from the RHS. Um, so yeah, really good scent. Soft pastel pinks. High scent. Uh, so cream with a lavender edge to it. Mm -hmm. Really great. Good performer. And lastly, what I call my 
blue rinse sweet pea. <laughs> What's that? It's called Kingfisher. Uh-huh. Starts off uh, almost sort of pale white with just a, a hint of colour to it, and as it matures, it gets more of a blue rinse effect to it. It's, it's wonderful. Oh, wow. Have you got that here in the library? I, I, I haven't actually got it here this year, but it's, it's great. And oh, what a I like name it. Oh, well. That sounds amazing. Okay, um, we're going to talk about where people can buy seed from you, but first yep. of all, let's give the National Sweet Pea Society a little plug because you're heavily involved. Can you just tell us a few lines about it? If someone joins up, what, what can they expect to get and kind of how can we help societies like that to thrive these days as well? Okay, well, it's, it's National Sweet Peace Society been around for donkey's years. Um, very much uh, until recent times been heavily involved with uh, showing with the, the with the show sides of things, whether it be at the big national shows or, or little uh, village events. Mm -hmm. Um, and that type of thing tends to uh, draw in um, enthusiasts, that, that sort of environment. But mm -hmm. there's so many people in the country that, that love sweet peas, but maybe don't want to go on to that stage. Yeah. And we're trying harder and harder, particularly through um, the displays at the big garden shows that unfortunately aren't on this year, but mm -hmm. uh, through f promoting sweet peas through all the different types and all the variations and trying to encourage, uh, you know, pass on that knowledge about how easy sweet mm -hmm. peas are to grow uh, okay. and just giving tips. But also the sh social side as well, that's yeah. sort of getting together, we're having meetings in, in you know, or we were having meetings in uh -huh. on a much uh, more local scale and uh, people's houses and village halls and just talking about sweet peas and enjoying the social side of gardening as yeah. well. Yeah, I think hopefully that will start to come back because there's there are almost two different schools of thought. There's the traditional societies, then there's the kind of newbies that would then turn to social media, perhaps Instagram, mm. and they would be really keen on one specific plant and they would then find other people through using hashtags or however they might do that. And so the enthusiasts are out there, but it's kind of like we need to find it's a way for yeah. you guys to talk to each other. So we need to do a little bit of work there. But Absolutely. obviously, you know, we'll do through this podcast and various web articles what we can to highlight the National Sweet Peep Society. So thank you, Phil. So if people want to find out more about the retail seed range, they can go to a website? Where can yeah, they we've, do that? we've got a, a couple of websites offering mm -hmm. slightly different uh, different things, but we've got uh, englishsweetpeas.co.uk mm -hmm. and we've got johnsonssweetpeas.co.uk. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So if you are looking well, to grow welcome. sweet peas, that is a great place to start. And there's, I assume, lots of advice on the websites as yep, well? Yeah, lots yeah. of advice there as well. Okay, excellent. And always the contact page. Super. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. Thank you. The music for the Plant Based podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. 